Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. I'm your host, Priest, joined by my co-host, my brother, the one and only Phoenix. Say what's up to the camera. What's up, y'all? This is called the Burn Factory for a reason. I was literally caught on fire. 50% chance to survive, but through that, started this podcast because I believe every single person out there on this planet goes through a burn moment somewhere in their life. You heard Priest say a burn moment. So a burn moment is a super hard time in your life that you just have to fight and to get through to ultimately get you where you are today. And me and Priest believe that every single person on this earth go through burn moments every single day that truly build to who you are. But what an amazing guest we have today. This is a guest that I've been wanting for a very long time. He is a pioneer of mixed martial arts. He is now one of the most intelligent coaches in the game. You have seen him on Dana White's Looking for a Fight. He is also a UFC and ESPN analyst. He is also on Sirius XM as the host of the Fight Nation show. And to top it off, this man is an actor and a comedian. So please give a welcome to <laughs> Dean Thomas. What a what an intro. What, a, what, what an intro what a, that was. I had wow. to. You yeah. have Dean Thomas and you gotta wow. you gotta up you gotta it. read yeah. it. Oh I almost feel like I'm being pumped because this is too nice. <laughs> I, like, I feel like someone's gonna jump out and choke, start choking me from behind. What's going on with you? This is, What's up? This What's is up? way too nice. This is yeah. amazing. Be, be honest, were you shocked whenever you came in? I was shocked. You were? I was shocked because, I mean, I just met you guys at the fight last time. He was like, yo, yo, I'm going to come on my pop, you know, the podcast. I'm thinking, oh, here we go. It's going to be in a little hotel room. <laughs> a little stick mic. But <laughs> no, phone. man, this is, this. No. I'm blown away by the production here. This thank is amazing. You, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, if you guys didn't know, we met Dean Thomas back at UFC 289 in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. We told him about the podcast, and he said he's down to do it. And look at us now. We here have we him on. Here we are. Yeah. So you're a comedian. Yes. Well, I'm not very funny, but... Okay, I've seen yeah. every episode of Dana White's Looking for a Fight. You're well, pretty I've, damn funny. I mean, uh, you know, I, I just... You know, I've done comedy, improv. Uh, not, I've done some stand-up, but I've done more, a lot of improv. Uh, you know, where we get on and pretend to do be different things. I've done that for over a decade. So that's where my comedy comes from. Can you tell us a joke? Well, I don't do... <laughs> I, no, I, just, I mean... Give us the punchline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just got to be fly with it, I yeah. guess. Yeah. When did that kind of start for you? Um, I started doing improv. Well, first off, I started acting in like 2005 as just a way to get more comfortable in front of a camera. Because as a fighter, like that's part, like performance is performance. It doesn't matter whether you're fighting, public speaking, acting. Performance is performance. Being able to focus and deliver. So I figured that acting would be a good way for me to work on that performance muscle and so i said you know what i'm gonna start acting and i started doing that and then during that time my fight career started to take off a little bit so then i had to put the acting aside but i still liked the performance side of that so improv you don't have to re remember scripts you just go out and do it so i said i'm gonna do improv because i don't have to remember anything i just show up and Learn how to how it works, and so I started doing that, and that's kind of how I got into improv. Did you do any school plays? No, I, I never no. did. I, but I've done a lot of theater, though. I've done a lot of theater, oh, yeah. like like community theater and stuff like that. And I've done a lot of improv. I mean, embarrassing improv. <laughs> I mean, like in, when I say embarrassing, embarrassing. What's the but most embarrassing? But that's that's part of doing improv, though, is is not being afraid, and that's and that has carried me all the way to where I am now, like doing things for Dana White and. Everybody's like, man, you got, man, you got, you know, cojones, you're doing this. I was like, man, this is improv. You do you know? think if you didn't do improv, your life would be totally different? It'd be totally different, for sure. It'd be totally different. And, you know, we I've done guerrilla improv, and that is where you go on the street. So we, I live in West Palm Beach, just where I, where I do my stuff at. And we go on the street downtown, and we just, when people are eating it, like, out, outside the bar, we just do improv for them. Really? We just, just, we just walk, walk, up. walk up and go, like, all right, we're going to do some improv for you Give us a suggestion, and then we just start doing improv. Really? <laughs> yeah. You said you've done some embarrassing improv. What's probably the most embarrassing? I mean, that's one pretty you embarrassing. Just because, walking up. Yeah, just walking well, up to people like, and they're just trying to eat eat a meal, and we're like, we're and they're like, get out of here, you know. So uh, yeah, so uh, that's pretty embarrassing. And then one time, so another story I had is um when my son was really young, he was probably about seven or eight. I did a show in Miami, and it was so embarrassing. I mean, it was like. No one laughed. It was just so oh. embarrassing. And then my son was there. It was his first time being there. Oh. And when we got done, he we get in the car. He's like, Dad, you guys were so bad. I was oh. like, I know. 
It was embarrassing. What is it like <laughs> yeah. in the moment whenever you tell something, no one laughs? What do you do? Do you just like kind of like fold or? No, you just. I mean, it's part of part of the game. It's yeah. part of the territory, you know. Yeah. So, so when I, I did some stand up too, and same thing. I mean, I was just kind of used to it. So, like you tell a joke and it doesn't go over well, you're like, all right, move past it, get past it. Yeah. But you know, I did some stand. I was a, a comedy special on Fight Pass with uh, Adam Hunter. So oh, like that was okay. cool. So it was uh, me. It's uh, Adam Hunter's comedy special on Fight Pass. Me, Henry Cejudo, Chael Sonnen, and Adam all went up and did a show. So oh, cool. we'll have to go check that out. Yeah. I don't think I've seen it. No, nah, we'll yeah, go check it out. Go on Fight Pass. It's on Fight Pass. Fight it's still up yeah. there. Yeah, it's still. Oh, yeah. We'll have yeah. to go check it I out. I guess we'll go check it out. Yeah. But all right, Dean. So on this podcast, we do use the acronym Burn. So each letter is a different time in your life. So B stands for beginning. Take us back the beginning your childhood were there any burn moments that you had to overcome that ultimately got you to where you are today well i mean uh, so uh, are you just b and then the u is the which one unfortunate unfortunate, unfortunate. and then the r is the ridiculous ridiculous and then n is uh now we're all kind of the same right yeah, yeah. And in, in their own way so in their own way so yeah take so, us to the beginning all right, in the beginning i was i was born and i grew up in delaware a small town um, I just went back the other day, saw some of my old buddies, so I mean, that oh. was cool. But yeah, small town. Um, then I eventually moved to Florida when I was 13. So, um, and I moved to Florida because my father and my mother split because he was an alcoholic. So they, you know, they separated. I moved to Florida with my mother. Me and my brothers and sisters moved to Florida and then grew up in the sticks of Florida. So I essentially I grew up in like these small towns. And I think that helped me personally because I had to figure things out on my own. So I was very independent. I had to figure I had to figure stuff out on my own. So even when I first moved to Florida, I had to teach myself. I taught myself how to cut hair. My, me and my brother, my, me, <laughs> no me and my brother, we needed it. We needed hair because I taught myself how to cut hair. So all through high school, I was a barber. I had a barber shop in my mother's garage, and that was how I put. I mean. Uh, for a high school kid, I was banking too, man. I was, I was, I was, <laughs> yeah. I was banking in high school because I was, I had a barbershop. I taught myself how to cut hair and taught myself how to have a bar, you know, run a business. Yeah, how in high school? How did you even like know how to cut hair? Just watching shows, or did no, you just, just kind of went just with the flow? No, I was like, you know, when we first moved, we didn't have a barber. I was like, man, we need to go buy some clippers and then just. Started kind of practicing. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Like our entire family is uh, hairstylists and barbers. My mom is a hairstylist. My cousin are barbers. I can tell. Twenty yeah, seconds. I, <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. You like my flow? Yeah. Yeah. You got the nice little locks. Uh -huh. Yeah. He just lets it go, but um, it's very difficult. Like I've tried it once on like a little mannequin, and it's hard. Yeah, it's like it easy. takes a lot of practice. Yeah, to be able easy. to get good yeah. at it. Yeah. And so then, and then when I first started fighting, I was a you know, I was a licensed barber. So like I had oh, went wow. to school, got my license to cut hair, and. And that's what I thought I was going to do. I thought I was going to open a barber shop and just be a barber. That's what I thought. But at the same time, like, I was fighting. So, and then the UFC did what it did, and now here we are. So, what age did you start fighting at? As uh, soon as I graduated high school. That probably goes into my unfortunate situation, though. Okay. So that's what okay. I'm saying. It's, okay. it's all kind of un, in, intertwined. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, so. But in the beginning, it was just, you know, I was just a shy, quiet little kid who, uh, very introverted, but introspective from being introverted. So that's why like, it was, I don't want to say it was easy for me to teach myself how to cut hair, but being not, you know, not being, not being so influenced by my external stimuli, just being always like internal. It was, I was able to teach myself how to cut hair and teach myself how to do a lot of things like fighting. Mm -hmm. That's how I, I even got started in fighting. Like I didn't have an instructor. I didn't go to a school or a gym. It was like, I bought tapes, and me and my boys was in the backyard practicing. Wow. And that was the beginning. Yeah, that was the beginning. And I was winning fights off of that. Wow. How long until you finally got into, like, a stable, like, team or, like, a gym? I had actually did, did what I was doing until I was – and I was even teaching. Wow. So, like, that's, like, as a coach now, like, I'm, I'm not just – like, I, my entire career I had been teaching and coaching guys. Cause like I had to teach all my sparring partners how to do it, so like yeah. I have sparring partners. So um, I didn't really join a team until I had already fought in the UFC. I had fought like right after I fought BJ Penn. Yeah, after I fought BJ Penn. 
Wow. So you're yeah. completely self-taught. So up, yeah, up, up to that, that point, point, yeah, I was pretty much self-taught. Just going to different gy- like I for self and go to different gyms and beat up guys in different <laughs> gyms. Is it true that you say that you're a better coach than you are a fighter? Yeah, for sure. For sure. What, for what sure. makes that? Um, just because I think I could have been a really good fighter, but I didn't have someone like me to validate what I was doing because I was so out of the box. Me and Al Jermaine Sterling was talking about this yesterday that like he does things so different, but everybody wants him to do things the the traditional way. Like he's like, man, I, I can't box like a boxer. I'm not gonna do it. And they're trying to get me to box like a boxer. And I said, You absolutely cannot do that. Because that's what happened to my career. In my career, I was so out of the box because I had taught myself how to do things. And then when I started working with more traditional people, they put me back into this box in which I was no good. And then I, I can recall losing fights by trying to fight a style that didn't suit me. So for me, I was like, you know what, I got to stay and do what I'm doing. So as a coach, I don't try to put anybody in a box. I find out what I think they're good at, and I fix it. I'm, I think of myself as more like a scientist or a doctor. You know, when you go to a doctor, you know, you got to figure out what's wrong with you. You know, if you got this ailment, you got to take this prescription. You got that one. Some of them might look the same, but you can't take the same thing. So as a coach, I look at that and go, this is your problem. You can't just go to a boxing class and fix it. You got to fix it with this. So that's why, I, that's why I think I'm a better coach than I was fighter. Okay. Do you think more coaches need to kind of develop that mindset? It's hard because their ego gets involved and their ego and, and their tra- tradition of where they, where they came from, their upbringing. So like if you, if you come from a wrestling background, you're always going to filter the game of MMA through wrestling, which is why. So you know, I work on a broadcast with DC, and DC is always like, "They got to get up. They got to get up. They're on the back. They got to get up. It doesn't work. They got to get up." Because he's always going to filter the game of MMA through wrestling. Me, I never had a background, so I don't filter it through anything. I filter it through what works, what works at the highest percentage, and that's how I filter the game. I feel like that affects fighters, too, because you see sometimes they're bouncing around gyms continuously trying to just find that coach that's going to take them and develop their style better. And it's hard, too, because like, but that's a problem, too, because a lot of fighters don't want to be accountable for their own thing. And what they're doing is they're looking, they're seeking the answer, but really the answer might be within themselves that they just need to sit down and listen to somebody. Anybody. Yeah, they and need yeah. that extra support from yeah. someone different eyes on but, it. But, yeah, but oftentimes, you know, they'll go to one gym and then it doesn't work out, and then they'll blame everybody at the gym, then they'll go to another gym and blame everybody. But the reality is it might be themselves. So you, that, and that's the one thing I always tell fighters is you have to be accountable. Like everything you do, there's – every. so I was in Philly. I was working with Sean Brady and before he got hurt, and even when he got hurt, I was like still teaching the classes. I was like, listen, I just want to teach. Yeah. And, I, and my, my main thing is this. When you're out there and fighting, like, you have to be accountable. You can't be like, oh, this guy was too strong. He was too fast. You got to be accountable. You got to find a way to make it work. That is it. There is a way. You got to find it. You just have to be accountable. But when you start pointing the finger at everybody else, you can't be accountable. And you can't fix your problems because you're already relying on somebody else to fix it for you. You got to be accountable. How that many, goes for anything in life. How many fighters do you coach? Not many now. I work with um, just a couple. You know, mm-hmm. I just work with a couple now. Like, I, I still work with Jillian Robertson. I've been working with Sean Brady. Um a couple of guys in Bellator, J.J. Wilson and uh, Darian Caldwell, but um, just a couple. Uh-huh. Is, it, is it hard bouncing around from different states while they're in camp somewhere and someone else might be in camp? No, no. And, I mean, that, that may just be me, not when, <laughs> yeah, me and my commitment issues. You know, I don't, wanna, I don't really want to be committed to anybody. I've done that for a long time, and, I th- and that was a problem for me, too. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to leave American Top Team because I was a coach for, like, I had – American Top Team gyms for a long time. And then when I was a coach for them for about five years, just a full-time coach, it was a problem for me because I always wanted to work with different people. Mm -hmm. And in this game is information-based. And I just feel like it's education and information, just like going to school. And to hold on to it is selfish. So I was like, well, I don't want to just sit here and just like coach these guys. Like there's other people out there that could use this information. And if I can't get it to them, you know, I'm not doing the world a service. We're not going to see the best of the best. Like, that's what I want when I see a fight. I love watching Volkanovski fight because he delivers and he gives you stuff. And, like, I love to watch that performance. 
And if I can be a part of helping somebody fight that way, I'll do it. Volkanovski's a bull, man. He's not scared <laughs> to take a fight. Yeah, to you. no, that's he what I'm saying. He doesn't point the finger anyways. Like when he lost to Islam, he was not pointing the finger. No, he like, oh, he was bigger than yeah. me. He's he's heavier than me. He he was like, he's the better man this that did. night. That's, and that's why I like I like watching him fight. He's he's accountable for his actions. He does what he gotta do and and he's a great fighter because of it. And yeah. pound for pound right now. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, Dean, it's time to go to you and burn. It's unfortunate. There's a lot of unfortunate burn moments that happen, but through those unfortunate burn moments, some of the best burn moments come out of it. Unfortunately, I was caught in a school science experiment by my teacher. It was a fire, blew up in my face, spent a week in ICU, had seven surgeries, and a 50% chance to survive. Because with burns, the swelling around the neck, it's so bad, and they're worried that I was going to, like, my breathing was going to stop. But in the hospital, I found my burn moment. So I'm a competitive golfer, and I had my family go get my putter, all hooked up to all the IVs, my face swelled shut, couldn't even see out of my left eye. And I would put three balls into a glass jar for hours and hours. And that's when I was like, you know what? I'm going to get out of this hospital and I'm going to go take this unfortunate burn moment and make it into the greatest comeback ever. And now I got a Burn Factory podcast. So Look at you. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. so inspiring. I mean, that's kind of the reason why I'm here. Because when y'all told me that story, I was gutted. I was like, oh, yeah. I got to do the show. But um, but yeah. So my unfortunate story goes back to when I was in high school. So I was dating a girl, and like I don't know how old are you? Seventeen. Yeah, I was your age. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was your age, and but I had been dating her for a couple of years. And when you're seventeen, you date a girl for a couple of years. That's a couple of decades. <laughs> Understand that? It's a big portion of your life. <laughs> yeah. So like we were in love, and um, but then as my senior year in high school, you know, we thought we were going to break up because we were going to go in different directions. So she started seeing another guy, and. And when you're 17, somebody starts seeing another guy, that's like life and death. That's like, you know, it broke my heart. It killed me, broke my heart. So like any juvenile delinquent, I had to take matters into my own hands. And like your, your situation was an unfortunate situation. Mine was totally wrong on my part. So I took it upon my own self to hit the dude in the head with a wrench. Oh, Yeah, I hit him in the head with a wrench and I ended up going to jail and having to do, do a little time. And I couldn't go to college, couldn't do anything from it. So I had to stay home and eventually did 50 weekends in jail. We're going on Friday, spend the night, spend two nights in there and then come out on uh, on Sunday. I did that for a year. How hard is that? It was very difficult because it was like, partially I was like, yeah, I should just, you know, I should just do three months straight. But then... I don't know if I can do that either. So I was like, all right, I'll do the weekends. Yeah. Uh, so, but what? It, but doing weekends, it, it taught you a lot about time and patience, right? And learning how to just be like, be able to sit with yourself and be patient. But going to jail every weekend for a year sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sucks. And um, and I, it was to the point where like it was so boring. You look forward to like they allow you to have like going out and picking up trash. And I was like, all right, let me just go out and pick up trash. It uh -huh. sucks, but it sucks. But yeah, but that was my unfortunate situation. I had to deal with that. And I had to sit and live with myself knowing that I did that for, like, no reason. For, like, a really stupid reason. Yeah. But um, but this was about the same time where I first saw the UFC. So, really, at the end of the day, having to sit with myself really kind of drove me towards the UFC a little more. And then that's when I was like, I'm going to learn how to do this. So, I couldn't leave, couldn't do nothing, couldn't go nowhere. So, I was used that unfortunate situation to kind of learn how to fight. Yeah, so you're saying if that whole situation doesn't happen, you won't be in the UFC? Right, if that situation doesn't happen, I'm not here right now. Wow. It's a burn moment. Yeah, that's crazy. that's my burn moment. Was During that toughest time of going to juvenile jail over the weekends, was there one particular thing that just made you happy, that brought joy to you during that toughest time? Um... No, not really. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. I mean, it was nothing about that that made me happy. But looking back, it was necessary. It's necessary because I needed to sit in it. I needed to sit in it, and I needed to be like, all right, this is how you focus. Otherwise, like you get, distractions come easy. You can get distracted easily. But having being forced to not leave the county, couldn't leave the county, 
I had to show up <laughs> to jail every Friday. I had to sit in it. So mm -hmm. having to sit in it forced me to learn how to focus. Were you in school during this time? Or no. was this summer? This is this was in the summer of I had planned to go to college in this the year right after I graduated. So I was out of school and that happened as soon as school ended and I was Yeah, so like I spent my first year out of high school <laughs> dealing with legal issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so I yeah, and I, but but again, necessary because I had to sit in that. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn how to be by myself. And I had to learn how to do things by myself, which I already had, you know, felt like I was pretty good at. Like I said, teaching myself like a hair and doing this. But so then I just used that time to just study fighting. Mm -hmm. And I was studying fighting way back then. What was that last day like? The last day? Oh, you <laughs> I was like, y'all can kiss my bleed. <laughs> This got <laughs> yeah, that last day was great. I mean, I was like, I ain't. But also, too, I guess if there's any one good thing about it is that people who go to jail, they know right away. Like, either jail, either you can do it or you can't. But once you walk in there, you're like, I can't do it. This ain't for me. And now yeah. I know. Like, I don't do nothing. I ain't, I'm not spitting on the sidewalk. I won't do anything, anything illegal because I know I don't ever, ever want to go back because it's not for me. Some people don't mind. Like, I, I used to see people come and go and they just don't care. And that's how it is for some people. Some people don't care. But for me, once you step foot in that place, that is it. I ain't never going back. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. I can't even imagine it. I would be the same way if I went. I would just obey by nothing. I wouldn't even throw kind of what you say, yeah. gum on the side. Yeah, like, I wouldn't even do yeah. nothing. Yeah. Roof all over. Yeah, exactly. What was the, what was the go-to meal after? Uh, right when you got out. Right when you got out. Um... Was it some fast food restaurant? Probably, probably. <laughs> you know, I was poor. You know what I'm saying? So, like, Burger King was my thing. You know, McDonald's oh, Burger and Burger King. King. Yeah. Okay. What's the go-to at Burger King? At the time, even still kind of now, at the time, it was it was chicken sandwiches. Chicken sandwiches. In oh. fact, I, my, whole, my whole fight career, that was my go-to. Really? Yeah. Like, you know, nowadays, you know, everybody's scientific. Everybody got nutrition. Listen, <laughs> back in the day... <laughs> I was going. I was going through because I used to live across the street from the University of Central Florida, and there was a McDonald's or not, but Burger King like right around the corner. And after practice, I hit up that Burger King and be like, oh. "Boom, give me." <laughs> and they were a dollar at the time. I was like, "Give me three of them and some barbecue sauce." Uh, <laughs> that was my meal. Uh, three of them and some barbecue sauce. Nowadays, it's like twelve bucks. Yeah, for I know. Just that. Yeah, nowadays it's expensive. It's yeah, it's expensive now. So like, I might as well just eat. I might as well eat decent now because it's you know it's. Expensive to eat uh, your fast food. Yeah, he's it like is. that. He's he's all into McDonald's and all yeah. Food. I'm a I'm not I like a good that. Did either. you ever get the the chicken fries from Burger King? I never had those. You never had those. I never oh, had. Oh, you gotta go try them. I gotta try them. Do you like spicy food? Sometimes. Okay, get Sometimes. the spicy ones. Yeah. They're not too hot. You gotta try them. They're really yeah. really good. I gotta try that. Was for your sure. was your uh, chicken? What you chicken sandwich better than the sheet balls you ate on Dana White Contender Series? Oh. <laughs> Actually, they weren't that bad. Uh, listen, I know you, can, you like them. You can, you can fry anything. Listen, you fry anything, oh. it tastes pretty good. Oh, <laughs> oh. What's the texture like? Yeah. Um, like I said, you just fry it, and it just you don't even taste it. You just oh, taste yeah. like fried. It just tastes like fried whatever. I you, do, you do everything on that show. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I have to. You know, like, that's my thing. I have to. Because Dana ain't going to do it. And Matt, that, Matt is the most... Matt won't do anything he doesn't want to do. <laughs> Nothing. Really? Nothing. He won't do anything he doesn't want to do. You can't talk him into anything. The peer pressure won't work? Nope. Was that, I, you know, it was it was so weird. Like, and this is so we were on, we did Rogan a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I saw that. Yeah. So we did Rogan a few weeks ago and we got the opportunity to do that. Like Ro, I was talking to Joe and he's like, yo, you you think Matt'll come on? I was like, I don't know, man. Matt don't go nowhere. He doesn't he doesn't leave Long Island. He's like, Matt don't go nowhere. He's just all isolated. Yeah, so then so then Joe Rogan texts Matt. And say, hey, you want to do the show? And Matt texts me, he's like, yo, who is this? Is this real? <laughs> I was like, yeah. He's like, man, I'll do it. So, yeah. <laughs> I was like, Joe Rogan. You know, yeah. so yeah, and it had to talk him into that. <laughs> was it awkward being with Matt Sarah, though, since you fought him in the UFC? No, 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 no. no. I mean, Matt's like my best friend. Yeah. For sure. He's my best friend for sure. I mean, we have, we have a lot of history that goes back over 20 years. And um, just, you know, because he was room, his roommate was a Rodrigo Gracie and I had a grappling match with Rodrigo Gracie in Danbury, Connecticut in I think it was like year 2000 and he broke my elbow so oh. I obviously lost the match yeah and then that same year Matt Sarah had a grappling match with my roommate 
Paul Rodriguez for in the Abu Dhabi trials to go to Abu Dhabi. And he choked my roommate out. So, like, Matt had already, yeah. So, Matt has always been, like, one up on me. Yeah. For, you know, all of our careers. So, um, when we fought, it was a split decision. And they announced him as the winner inside the octagon. Then 10 minutes later, they came back and told me that I had actually won, that the judge got it wrong. He had scored it wrong. He scored his, he put his, he put the scores for Matt on my side. And he's, yeah. He mixed switched up the cards. Mixed the card. Yeah. So were you already in the back at that time? Yeah, no, we were was... in the back when he announced me as the winner. Oh man, wow. that's gonna be crazy. And then yeah. I want talk if... about emotions. Yeah, I know. It was like because I'm down. I'm like, yeah. Uh, when they announced him the winner, I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I th- how did this happen? Couldn't believe it. And then when they told me I won, I was like, yes. So then uh, that's why only had, there was an episode of Dana White looking for a fight. We were in Sturgis. I went and got a tattoo on my arm. It's right here. It says, "Hey Matt, I won." So like, I, <laughs> oh, no <laughs> yeah, way. Hey Matt, I won. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What was his reaction to that? He was like, "Man, you're so stupid." <laughs> <laughs> when did you get When did you get this? What year? Um, I just got that ta- that mm, it was a couple years ago. Okay, did it, it hurt? Years. Oh yeah, I, you know I got I got like the worst tattoos because they hurt. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, people get tattoos and like I'm like I don't know how to I don't know how these people get tattoos. It hurts so bad, and they're like, "You going to get that finish?" I'm like, "It's finished. It's finished. It's, it's, finished. Done. it's, it's done. done. That's it." It's how Watch. many do you have? Uh, one. I have about five. Oh yeah, about but five. they're all small and and cheesy. Yeah, they're like prison tattoos. Yeah, yeah. Like if I told you I got them in prison, you'd believe me. Yeah, they're all small and cheesy. That's crazy coming from a fighter though, because people think fighters are so tough because they just get hit in the head constantly and they're bleeding. But getting a tattoo, it still hurts. No, see, that's the misconception about fighting is that it's not that painful. Really, and if you're doing it right, it shouldn't be that painful. Because your job is to protect yourself. Like, that should be your, as a fighter, your number one job. I know how it looks on TV where guys are killing each other, but that's because, like, they just have a hard time protecting themselves. Or that, you know, that's whatever their training is. But your number one job should be to protect yourself. That's why I won't do pro wrestling, because your job in pro wrestling is to get hurt. Yeah, yeah. So, like, for fighting, it's my job is to protect myself. So I'm trying not to get hurt. So, like, that. Yeah, I'm not getting hurt. I see. Did you ever get knocked out? What does, yeah. it, what does that feel like? Oh, it felt great. <laughs> what? It felt great. It, felt, it was amazing. Dude, it was amazing. No. It was actually my. It was actually my very first fight in the UFC. It was against BJ Penn, and you know, so because I was the I was the dude at that time. I was the I was the big deal. Like BJ was just a jujitsu guy, so like I was the favorite. It was in New York. It was the uh, co-main event. Um. And the main event was Tito Ortiz and Elvis Sinisek. So it's UFC 32. I, so I was the big Dang. I was the big deal at the time. And uh, I go out there, I'm fighting BJ. Man, I tried to take his head off. I threw the biggest punch I've ever thrown in my life. Because I thought I tried to fake with the right. I tried to move his head over, and I threw the biggest left. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I missed. And he didn't, because he, he didn't fall for the fake. <laughs> If I just like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't set a fake good enough. Yeah. So I threw the fake and I threw the punch. I missed. And it, as a jujitsu guy, I was expecting him to duck under the punch and try to shoot. Yeah. So at that moment, after I missed, my natural reaction was to stop the shot. So I, I put my head down, and instead of shooting, he gonna throw a knee. Oh. Why he throw a knee? Why he throw a knee? <laughs> he ain't a knee. So he, so I ended up boom, and I just knocked out. I was out. Do you just go to sleep whenever you get knocked yeah, out? Yeah, like, I just, I do remember, like, the world kind of spinning, and then I just, then I remember waking up in the back. I don't remember walking out. I don't, I, I had to watch that on TV. I don't remember walking out of the octagon. I watched that on TV, I, but uh, I do remember being in the back and the doctor going, what month is it? And I was like, it's March, but it was June. Oh. Yeah, I remember saying so that, scary. and then I and then it goes blank again, and then I remember being in the ambulance, going to the hospital, going. Then I, that's when I really woke up, and I remember going, "Oh no, what happened?" And I, all I could think about was, "Oh, we got to do this again. This this can't be real. We got to go back." And I was like, "Tell him, call him back, and tell him I'm ready to go now." <laughs> yeah. and like, and tell him I'm ready to go now. Tell him I'm ready to go now. But then then I think about it, I go, man, I felt pretty good though. Uh, you know, like, felt like a good rest. <laughs> uh-huh. Is it? Oh. It was amazing. Do you, Do you think it's true that people that like don't get knocked out for so long in the UFC and then they finally get clipped, they just keep getting clipped after that? Or sometimes that happens. Like you, you can lose your chin, and oh, I yeah. mean, we've seen eventually you lose your chin. 
Mm-hmm. And we've seen that happen over and over again. Like Chuck Liddell is a prime example. Like you can pluck him now and he'll go down. Yeah. But eventually, like once you start, but once you get knocked out the first time, it's like opening Pandora's box. It becomes easier after that. So like oh. that's why it's important to. You feel like relieved after. Yeah. Like almost <laughs> like almost like I know like now like there's no fear going into the fight. What of, of getting knocked yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 uh-huh. no, no. Like I mean, you kind of want your chin. Like you kind of yeah. you, you kind of want a chin. I feel like once you get knocked out, though, it completely changes you. Like you become a little bit more reactive than proactive. You absolutely. And I remember. So when I was on the Ultimate Fighter, um, I remember Mikey Burnett, who I actually fought in the house. He he was talking to me, and he was like, "Man, ever since he's like before you knocked BJ out, you were a killer. Then afterwards, you kind of stopped." And that's what happens. Like you get a little gunshot because you don't want it to happen again. And that's what it was. And it wasn't the feeling of getting knocked out. It was just the embarrassment. Yeah. Like, sure. That's why like when guys get knocked out, like you, you see like Michael Johnson get knocked out and he's like, I'm like, man, how does he come back from that? These guys come back from it. Like for me, I was like, if I get knocked out like that one more time, it's, it's that's done. It. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, that's yeah. it. I'm moving. <laughs> yeah. I can't go back home. It's probably uh. so hard mentally too. Like just the embarrassment, like you say, of of letting your team down and letting people down. Yeah, because like everybody's watching. Like that's how it was for me because this was in a time like right now the UFC is accessible. Like we watching on ES. I'm watching on a plane. I'm like, what? <laughs> but when I had fought, it was the first time it was back on TV, back on pay per view. Because it John Senator John McCain had gotten it off TV. This was the first one back on TV. So I'm like, yo, watch the show. I'm fighting this dude. Watch watch it. And I remember even, like, I was hype. I, I remember, you know, uh, what's his name? Dennis Rodman was at the arena. And oh, I was like, yo, Dennis, no check this. I was like, yo, Dennis, I'm about to go fight. Yo, watch this fight. <laughs> and then afterwards, I was like, oh, man, I can't believe this. Yeah. Everybody saw it. I was like, everybody saw it. I was like, how do I go home from this? Oh, it sucked. Yeah. I can't even imagine what the next day is. Well, speaking, what is it like the next day after? After getting knocked yeah. out, oh, your your weekend is ruined. Like you're just like yeah, you're just embarrassed. You how don't do, want to do anything. Huh. How do you come out of that? Like what, was, oh, it took, what did it you took me, do to come out of that? It took me a couple of months. It took me a couple of months to come out of that. Really? It took me a couple of months because I remember I was like, oh, I so. But this was the first time where I actually so like after that, I went to so I got another fight booked. So that was in June. I got another fight booked in Vegas. It was the first fight in Las Vegas history. So um. And that was in September. So I, I spent September, the first part of September, in Los Angeles training for the first time. And then on September 11th, 9-11 was the day where my ticket, I was supposed to come back, go back home to Florida. 9-11 happened. I got stuck in Los Angeles <sighs> for a week. So I'm in Los Angeles, stuck in Los Angeles for a week trying to prepare for a fight that it was happening in September 28th. So did it end up getting pushed at all or no? No, we, we still, still did the go. fight. We still got still got the fight, but I could there were no flights leaving during that time for a whole week. So I got stuck in, in Los Angeles. I had to hang out in Los Angeles for a week, just kind of bumming around, training when I could. And it kind of sucked. But again, but like I was prepared. You know why I was prepared? Because I did 52 weekends in jail. So like yeah, nothing at that. See? So yeah, that's what I'm saying. So like Every time something bad happens now, I go, man, I did 52 weekends in jail. Yeah, you know, so like, like this now, is nothing. Yeah, this is nothing. Yeah, it's crazy to see how, kind of like how I was saying earlier, the unfortunate burn moments can really help you in the yeah. future. I always draw back on that, so I'm thinking, oh, this is nothing. You know, this is sure better than being in jail. <laughs> <laughs> this portion of the Burn Factory podcast is sponsored by Phoenix Salon Suites. Please visit Phoenix Salon Suites at P H E N I X Salons S A L O N Suites S U I T E S dot com to find one near you. We are going to move on to R now. R stands for ridiculous. You kind of alluded a little bit. Dana White looking for a fight and eating those, what were they, sheep Cheap testicles? Moments. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so were there any more ridiculous burn moments that you have gone through in your career? I mean, the, my whole career is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> like just to be, to be, Doing this now, I, I find it to be ridiculous because, you know, the game now is so different than it was before. I mean, it was so wild, wild west to see where it is now, to see everybody making a, a lifestyle happen because of this game is crazy. It's, it's tr- tremendously ridiculous. But the fact that I got on Dana White looking for looking for a fight is pretty ridiculous because, I, I mean, I don't even know how I really got on that show. I, I remember I was training Amanda Nunes. To fight Valentina Shevchenko, or not? Nah, because she was fighting um, 
Misha Tate for the title. I was training Amanda for that, and I got a phone call from a 702 number. And I'm like, man, who is this? I don't know who that is. I just hung up on him. And then Matt Sarah sends me a text. Hey, man, listen, Dana's trying to call you. Oh. Dana who? Dana White. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, what did I do? Yeah. Am I I'm in like, trouble? Yeah, like, I'm like, what did I do? And then he goes, so then I'm like, all right. So then I call him back. I said, what's up? He's like, he's like, Dean, what's happening? I'm like, what's up? He's like, you ever seen the show looking for a fight? I was like, of course I have. I didn't. <laughs> no, I, never seen it. I was like, of course I have. And um, he's like, well, you know, our third guy can't do it anymore. Would you like to do it? I was like, of course. Are you kidding me? And he goes, all right, but the catch is you got to leave tomorrow. I was like, I got my bag packed in the car. I had the bag packed in the car. Because I'm always, always, always ready. I'm yeah. always ready. And they sent me a ticket, and I was on the show the next day. I was on the show. What yeah. was the first episode? The first episode was Los Angeles, and that was the first time where I actually did stand-up comedy. Yeah. Because that was the episode where we did stand-up comedy. All the three comedy. did yeah. stand-up comedy. Yeah, we all did stand-up comedy. <laughs> yeah, and I was like... and. I ain't gonna lie, man. That was a. Th I mean, cause I had a, I had done a, a tremendous amount of improv, but that's different. You're on stage with people, and you're just acting out scenes. But like to get on stage and look out in front of a crowd and tell them, "Listen, I'm funny. I'm gonna make you laugh," and then tr and then do it was hard. Like I was like I was nervous. I was really nervous. But what helped me from not being as nervous was watching Dana be nervous. <laughs> I mean, he was back there. His hands was shaking. He was. And he had somebody write his jokes. Oh. Oh. He had Tony Hinchcliffe no. write his whole set, and he was still nervous. I was just about to ask you that. Did you already know what you're going to plan to say during the comedy? No, or you just I, go no just I didn't know what we were doing. I didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> like so, when I got there, they were like, "All right, so here's the, here's what's on the itinerary." And they're like, "We're going to Randy's Donuts to make donuts. We're doing this, and then we're going to do a comedy set at the Laugh Factory." I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> Uh, they're like so so write a set i was like what i was like a real <laughs> comedy show and it was a real show like they had david spade was the headliner oh, oh my wow. gosh it yeah. was a it was, it was a big a, time show. it was a big time show Kind of like the hot dog eating contest you and Matt Sarah did oh, yeah, without I, even knowing yeah, that. I and did, pulled yeah, out a pizza yeah, and started yeah. eating it. <laughs> yeah, so that, that whole hot dog thing, man, I, I totally let myself. Eating hot dogs is a lot harder than you think. Like, you know, you, Fourth of July come around, you be like, you just pounding hot dogs. And, yeah, I got this. But when you are when you under pressure, <laughs> it's a lot harder than it looks. And you don't you probably didn't even get hungry because there's so much pressure. Going yeah, there. yeah, I wasn't hungry. I'm sitting there like, yeah, I got this. And then soon I ate like two of them. I was like, man, this is getting disgusting. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't like hot and then dogs. Dana, I don't think I could do it. Then Dana took you guys through a tour of the hot dog factory and oh, stuff yeah. and being and made. Oh, and it was it, disgusting. It was it smelled like like grease <laughs> and like oh like boiled rat. It just smelled <laughs> nasty, yeah. Could you eat a hot dog right now, Phoenix? Not anymore. <laughs> Not because you guys are talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, Ugh. and those were different kind of hot dogs, too. They were like, uh, they were called Red Snappers. And they only make them in that area. And it's like a hard casing where, like, you you bite into it and it snaps. Almost oh. like a balloon. Do they taste differently? No, it doesn't really taste differently. It's just got a different texture. Uh, okay. And it's, like, really, like, red, like, lipstick. Oh. It's disgusting. Like, like a jalapeno. Yeah. Now yeah, I definitely kinda, don't want the hot dog. Yeah, yeah kind of. It was kind of disgusting. Oh. Oh, so out of all the Dana White's looking for the fights, what do you think is the most ridiculous thing that you did? Um, I tell you, with the most, uh, it, it, for me, like even when I think back to, to when I did it, I'm like, why did I do that? And that was <laughs> swimming with sharks. Swimming with sharks, and it wasn't. That we swam with sharks. So I remember when we were going to do it, they were like, are you going to get in the cage? And you're going to go down with sharks? And I was like, all right, that's cool. As long as I'm in the cage, right? So then when we get on the boat and we go out three miles into the water, they go, no, nah, you don't want to use the cage. The cage is for, <laughs> the cage is for wimps. Oh, They're like little kids go out. Don't tell me you had a free swim out there. Now keep in mind, I don't swim at all. I can't swim. And I jumped in. I had the life vest. You were the first one in. Too. I was the first one in. <laughs> and when uh, I hit that uh, water, I was like, I mean, I was so scared. I mean, it was one of them times where like I was I really was like, all right, this this might be it for me. Like that might be You're tell, facing death, tell, huh? I, I swear oh. I really thought I was. I was like, tell my family I love them. I really thought I was like, that this could be it. And I jumped in and first it was nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm in there by myself. I mean, it was like so nerve wracking. And then when I looked down, I saw my first the first shark, I was like, oh. What type of shark did you see? What, there what were type of um, shark? tiger sharks. 
Tiger, oh. aren't those like one of the most dangerous ones too? Tiger sharks. I think so. They're pretty dangerous. Uh-huh. So we're in, so then finally Dana jumps in and then Matt jumps in, and then they start throwing chum in the water. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Think, and, then, and, then, uh. and then I look and then I look down again, and one was coming right at me, and I couldn't get out fast enough. Oh. I said, "Get me the hell out of here!" I couldn't get out fast enough. I was like, "I'm done." I, I mean, I literally thought I was going to die. I, I can't even I imagine what's going through your head. I thought I was going to die. I would start I swinging up. Yeah. I get what I was like, and I and like I said, I don't know how to swim, so I was in there like <laughs> doggy <laughs> paddling, like, just, like just trying to get out as fast as I could. And as soon as I got out of the water, I was like, I felt this sense of relief, like I couldn't believe I just did that. Like that was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Where was this? And that was actually, oddly enough, it was like twenty minutes from where I live in Florida. Oh, okay. so yeah. it was in Florida. Yeah, it was in Florida. Wow. Oh, I I would never swim with sharks. I don't think I could do it. And like people, some people could, you know, do it. But like to be chumming the water and to to be antagonizing these sh- these sharks and getting them with no cage, either. right? No yeah, cage. You're like, just in there. I thought like with the cage would have been all right. I would have been like, all right, let's do yeah. it. You know, what I'm saying what are they gonna do to me? But no, nah. would like, you? No, never would you? Again. If, if Dana came back and said, hey, let's go redo this film of Swing with Sharks, would you go do it again? I'd say after you jump off the cliff in Hawaii. <laughs> oh, yeah, because he didn't, <laughs> do, he didn't that. do that. Yeah. <laughs> after you jump off that cliff, then I'll go swimming uh, with sharks. Yeah. How, sc- how scary was that? That wasn't that bad only because, like, I didn't really give myself an opportunity to be scared. Like, I, had, like, pumped myself up. Uh, yeah, it was on situations like we're in Hawaii. Hawaii, if you've never been to Hawaii, you got to go. It's an amazing place. We're in Hawaii. It's such a cool place. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to walk up. As soon as I get to it, I'm not even going to look. I'm just going to jump. And, again, I don't swim. But this time they wouldn't let me wear a vest because if you have a vest on, the vest won't go down. And you can, like, oh. break a rib by hitting the water. So, um, they were just like, we'll catch you when you go down. So, um, <laughs> catch you. Yeah. Well, I mean, not like, uh, yeah. not like, hey, hey, like hey. <laughs> no, it was like, so I jumped it. So I just, I walked up, walked up, and I just saw my spot and I jumped. And I just, I jumped and I hit the bottom of the floor, or the, the floor. And then oh, I just, you did. Yeah, as soon as I hit the bottom, I jumped back up and then they grabbed me. And I was like, <sighs> how many feet then, was the drop? Um, it's about 20, 30 feet, 20 or 30 feet. Uh-uh. That looks a lot bigger when you're standing up there. Yeah, oh, uh-huh. yeah, when you're standing up there. <laughs> yeah. was, and yeah. the rocks probably came out, too, yeah. so you have to like actually yeah, go and yeah. jump out far. When you're standing up there, I mean, it looks like... Uh-uh. Nope. I, but, you I'm know, the, 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 weird, the weird thing is I would probably do that again if I had to. I would probably yeah. do that again if I had to. Next time you go, I'll, I'll go do I'll go Yeah, do I need it. somebody to go. Where in there. Hawaii was it? I don't even know. You don't know? Yeah. Okay. Some... Wherever, wherever the Hawaiian dudes be. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, you guys went and got to go watch some fights and stuff. What type of what fights were they? Who um, was fighting some? In in the, in the Hawaii one, uh, who fought there? Mm, I remember it was a guy from Team Alpha Male, and he fought. I mean, it, Hawaii's got a lot of talented fighters. Like so, there's. If you've ever never if you've never seen like street fighting videos in Hawaii, you gotta go back and watch them because like everybody in Hawaii can fight. It's like they grow up, like they, they learn how to fight. So they had a lot of talented guys, but I think the guy that we picked up was from like Team Alpha. I can't remember who it was though, but and, and you guys signed him? him? Yeah, they signed him. Oh, that's cool. It's definitely getting a lot bigger, probably, especially with Max Holloway being champion. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. The big Simone. But they but they've yeah. always had like like good street fighters. So and like I said, if you go back and watch it, look like real boxers just scrapping. Yeah, it's crazy to see the evolution of MMA. Like, look at Mexico right now. You have I know three champions, three champ, almost could have had four. Could have had four. Could have had four. Close. Yeah, we were Mexico there for that one. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah Mexico, there. Mexico is um has really come up, and it's good to see that too. It's and really they're building up. the PI there, which is probably yeah. going to help help a lot. We need a. They need to get a event out there in Mexico someday. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, they had the one in Mexico City. But I don't think the, the guys. That really, was like years ago. Yeah, it was right? a long time. Yeah. It was Cain Velasquez and um, okay. Verdun. Mm. Huh. Do you think he'll eventually go back? I think so. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of it depends on what happens this weekend. Mm. If if Yair yeah. can pull this off, I'm sure that would help. Yeah. But if uh, Moreno, Moreno's a, a bona fide star. He's a star, and if he can if he can win, which he should, I think they, I, I think they'll do a show in Mexico. Who do you, who do you have in the main event, by the way? Volkanovski. Volkanovski, yeah. That's what I said. It's hard to go against him, man. Yeah. He's just shown and he's levels above everyone in that division. He's solid. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He doesn't leave himself open a lot. He makes adjustments faster than anybody. 
So, so good at reading. Yeah. You can read. Yeah. Like once you do something to him one time, you will never be able to do it to him again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It, it, like a lot of stance switches, a lot of feints. He almost kind of lulls the opponent to sleep. Yeah. He, 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 and he, he, he closes distance really fast too. So like he can be like snake charm you and then boom, jump on you. And meet. next thing you know, he's in on you. So. And he's not scared to go down to the ground either. No. And he's, I think he's got an underrated ground game. I mean, training with Craig Jones probably helps, but he's got an underrated ground game that I think could give Yair problems if he if they end up. I think that's the key to this fight, though, because I don't think he wants to spend too much time on the outside with a guy no. like Yair. Especially Yair, because you could be nose-to-nose with Yair, and he's throwing a head kick. Yeah, and he's, and his he's, kicks, man. And he's, he's got fight-changing weapons on his feet. In the prediction show, uh, I talked about how I feel like Volkanovski needs to go down to the map against Yair to win this yeah. one. I agree. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a good fight. All the fights Can't this weekend are going to be good. Can't wait for tomorrow. So I you're taking know. Moreno then in the co-main event? You think yeah, he's going to do it? Yeah, I think Moreno's a completely different guy. I think he's just so calm. And he's at such peace in his life. Like, we had him on the show, and he talks about, like, in the back, he's, like, singing his daughter's songs. Like, that's how at peace he is in his mind. And I think it really shows in his fighting. He's such a little kid, too. Like, he acts <gasps> the like Legos a little kid. Yeah, and stuff. Legos. And, and did you see the clip with him uh, trying to use the Gen Z words? There's a clip of it, like, you oh, know, no, it's like him and Robert so. Whitaker and a couple other fighters, and they're like putting words up that that you kids use, <laughs> and they're trying to trying to see what they mean. They're trying to like uh, give the definition, oh, so of them they, and they don't know them. And it's, it's pretty funny actually. Really? So they're kind of like slang words. Yeah, they're right? slang, yeah, slang words, say, and oh, yeah, okay. they're like sus and Rizzy or whatever. I don't oh, know, Rizzy, Riz Riz. or whatever. Oh. Yeah, I don't even know what I don't even I don't Riz. even know what they are. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> as much less you know, Brandon Moreno, and Brandon Moreno, like what is this? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even know him though. No, no, uh, no, no one did. Uh, <laughs> no one. Bo, Ni- Bo Nickel knew like one of them. He's younger too. Yeah, and he's a little he's, bit younger. Yeah, he's in the a little, bit, little What do you think about his last minute opponent change? Um, you know, I think it's unfortunate for a lot of other UFC fighters. Now I know Bo Nickel's a special case. I give him that, but the fact that he has to get help in order for him to do well. He's gonna have to get I get that. But I think he's getting a lot of help. For sure. He's I mean, because I, even Trayshawn Gore was a bit it was kind of help. Right. Like they're almost like trying to like pat his record almost to say. Yeah, I mean, the problem is he don't have any experience outside of the UFC because it's, so it's it's so that's why you can justify it. But then if if you're using that as justification for giving him beneficial matches, then why then say well maybe you should have gave him more experience outside of the UFC because I mean if you look at it so let's take a boost Nurmagomedov his second fight was Sean Strickland in the main event. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And Alaskarov, his second fight, his first fight was Phil Halls. His second fight is going to be Paulo Costa <sighs> for the BMF. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. We saw yeah. We, he actually yeah. fought in May in yeah. uh, Newark. Right. Yeah, we saw him fight. It, against Phil Halls. Yeah. Yep. Phil Halls yeah. out. And now we look at, you know, Bo Nickel, his third fight, he's fighting Val Woodburn. Yeah. <laughs> On you know on pay per view, so it's like I, I get where we got to give him help, but it's just kind of it's just kind of a little unfair, I think you know. Yeah, I agree, I agree. But all right, Dean, it's time to go to the last letter, and it's kind of two parts. It's now and next. So, what are some burn moments that you're going through right now in your life, and do you see any burn moments in the foreseeable future? Uh, for right now, you know, I'm just trying to catch up. You know, in terms of where everybody else is. One thing that I know is that you know you can't survive in any industry being the same you have to always evolve and you have to constantly reinvent yourself so i'm in the process now of burning myself like intentionally burning myself to reinvent myself more on this side where you guys are at on the media side because i can't fight (laughs) i'm (laughs) never going to like these guys come out i'm coming out of retirement and do bare knuckle I am never <laughs> going to do bare knuckle. I will be homeless it's cr- before it's I crazy. do bare knuckle. Yeah. Nope. Did you watch the Rockhold fight and uh, Mike Perry? Yeah. And, bare- and, and Rockhold should never do bare knuckle. Like this. <laughs> he should, like, he he's, not, he's not built for that. Like, yeah. And most most people aren't built for that. Like you got to be a special human being to do something like that. So Mike, I'm Mike not Perry. doing it. Yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing power slap. So I'm in. I'm I'm intentionally burning myself now to be better. At this stuff, so that this could be my next direction. Do you this think is you'll, where I'm going next? Do you think you'll actually move one day behind the desk and commentate, or do you, would you still? Oh, be like doing the, yeah, I, like I don't really, I don't necessarily like that role. 
Really? Yeah, like to be with, with Joe Rogan and them. I don't necessarily like that role. I like what I'm doing. Yeah. And then I like working the desk during the pre-show and the post-show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like, I, I like doing that. We saw also seen you kind yeah. of on the way in uh, shows. Yeah. And I stuff like doing like the way in shows. Those are fun. Yeah. Those are fun. So, and I'm also doing After Tough, the, um, the post-show mm-hmm. for The Ultimate Fighter. And that's probably my favorite role. So, like, that's really what I ultimately kind of want to do is, is more stuff like that. What makes that so fun to you? I mean... <sighs> And shout out to you know ESPN for allowing me to do it, but they giving me complete like control creatively. Mm. So like they allow me to bring in my characters and they allow me to do stuff and not be so scriptive, right? They're and they're just like that's what we want because we understand this is the entertainment business. You know we don't want you necessarily breaking down the X's and the O's. They want me making fun of people. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, comedy. They, yeah, they, yeah, they want me. They want me. So you know, the very first show I did like a, a Conor McGregor character, which I, I don't do an Irish accent. I actually uh, wrote I wrote like some stuff down and gave it to Molly McCann. Oh, yeah. She's from yeah. Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so if the accent is really bad, it's like <laughs> it's <laughs> like because she's from Liverpool. So I was like Molly, say this, and I'm gonna try to just say it the way you say it. So, well, well, it was one of like yeah, the words. Yeah, it was. Um, it's just like. Michael Chandler. Oh, Michael Chandler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then oh, you yeah. just did Michael the thing Chandler. with Chandler. Then yeah. you just did the thing with Juliana. Yeah, yeah with Juliana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so you know, funny. and like and and they're and they're cool about that. They they want that type of that type of energy. So to be able to do that and for them to have that type of confidence in me is yeah, I, I like that. So And that's what people want to see too, is yeah. yourself. They don't want to yeah. be yeah. Yeah, and I I mean, because anybody could have did that show. They could have gave that show to Megan O'Levy. Or, so the fact that they allow me to have that show, you know, that I'm like, all right, I got to be able to deliver. Mm. Okay, so looking forward to the future, do you have anything kind of brewing that you're excited about? So between between doing more stuff like that and I have a couple acting projects that I'm, that I'm working on as well. Oh. Again, burning. You know, burning through money to make this stuff happen <laughs> too, I'll tell you that. Yeah. But, um, but the reality is, is that... You know, a lot of actors, you know, they go through the process like auditioning and so on and so forth. And I was like, and I and I still audition for stuff sometimes. But at the end of the day, I'm creating my own projects. Me, I got a, a team of guys down in South Florida and we're creating pro- our own projects, doing like shorts and different projects. Because now, as, instead, if I'm going to waste money, like spending time trying to go on auditions and hoping I get this part, I'm not doing that. I'm creating my own projects. I'm going to finance my own projects. I'm going to burn through that money to finance my own projects and create the characters that I want. And that's how we're doing it. So we're in the process now of creating like a series. We want to do a series mm. um, in South Florida. So What's it like based off? Um, based, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a crooked cop. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm a crooked cop. You okay. know, okay. Dealing with um, some drug dealing guys and, and so on and so forth. What is uh-huh. it like acting though? Oh, I love it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's... You know, it's another creative process. Even as a fighter, I always thought of myself as more of a an artist type fighter. I mean, you look, look at fighters, artists, uh, Anderson Silva, uh, you know, Izzy. Those are more artist type mm, fighters, and that's yeah. kind of how I was. Yeah. But then, when I retired from fighting, I ne- I needed a place to express my art, so I do it now on screen. Yeah. Well, if you need someone to fill a role, you can call me. He's getting into acting. Oh, yeah. are you? Yeah. Yeah, man. I, listen, everybody work around me. I like I like everybody to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I take uh, acting lessons with uh, Jamie Foxx's acting coach. No kidding. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm Listen, new to Jamie. It. Jamie Foxx is hands down the greatest entertainer we've ever seen. For sure. So you are in good hands. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun because it's, it's something new. Kind of like with this starting this, it's new, and I'm able just to like learn and learn and learn, and it's. It's never stop awesome. learning. Yeah, yeah it's for awesome sure. to be able to take a character and like make it yourself. Right, like put yourself sure. into that character. Yeah, put yourself into them shoes and and create the colors of this of the words on the page. Right, to bring yeah. it to life. So exactly. like that's special. Exactly. What would be some advice that you give me as an aspiring actor? You just said it. Keep learning. Keep learning. Yeah. Well, you know what? Keep learning and take your yourself out of it. Because what we do is, you know, we put our own baggage onto things we got to take ourselves out of it and tell the story don't let your ego get yeah. in the way basically yeah don't let your mm-hmm. ego get in the don't let your ego get in the way don't let your baggage or your insecurities get in the way just tell the story yeah always that stay makes humble. a lot of sense yeah it makes a lot of sense yeah. but all right dean you just spelled burning your life so thank you so much for coming on the show 
Uh, tell the audience where they can find you at, your social medias, everything. All my social media is the same. It's at Dean Thomas. Dean is spelled D-I-N. You can hear me on Sirius Radio, on MMA Today, Sirius Fight Nation, and on ESPN during the fights, all kinds of stuff. I'm everywhere. I'm trying to, intentionally, I'm everywhere. So, <laughs> so Dean Thomas, at D-I-N Thomas, find me. You heard the man. Go give him some love. And as a gift, Dean, for coming on the podcast, you will be getting the Black Label Edition Burn Factory hoodie. Only guests get these. Ooh, Ooh only I guests. love it. I could use <laughs> yeah. a nice hoodie. On, only guests get these. So no Thank one you very else. much. For yes. real? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, for yeah. real. Only guests get yes. these. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I appreciate you guys. The belt. And the belt. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to, we'll get we'll to we'll that. We'll get to that. Oh. <laughs> but, all right. That's going to do it from this episode of the Burn Factory podcast. Like always, like follow and subscribe at the burn factory podcast and like always please visit my foundation as well the priest james foundation.org again the priest james foundation.org to understand why this is called the burn factory we'll see you guys for the next episode peace all right guys we're here with dean thomas who just spelled burn in his life and he is now the burn factory podcast champion <laughs> Awesome, dude. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. You were an inspiration to us. Definitely an inspiration to a lot of people out there. So thank you so much for coming on. I'm the champ. (laughs) I'm the champ. I love it. All right, man. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Yes. Thank you very much. Y'all refer to me as the champ. Yes, sir. (laughs) Champ Dean Thomas.